All right, here we go. So we're gonna be talking, uh, we got uh, two stories. Uh, one of them's by Ernest Hemingway, and the other one is by William Faulkner. I chose these two stories because uh, they were written around the same time, in the 1920s or early 1930s. And uh, these two writers are very, very different in their, in their styles. Uh, so one thing I wanna talk about is tone and diction. Uh, so tone is really important. Tone, I mean, you can say like, you can think about tone as the sound that your voice should make when you're reading the story. There's a lot of different kinds of tones. In fact, I have a list right here. These are all different tones. Mean-spirited, malicious, light-hearted, laudatory, joyful, jaded, irreverent, ironic, intense, intimate, outspoken. Any one of these could really be used to describe the sound, you know, of of a phrase or of a, of a, you know, if I was describing an event or a moment, I could describe it with a narcissistic sounding voice, you know, like uh, if I said my son won the state spelling bee, you know, I could say it nasty. My son won the state spelling bee. I could say it narcissistic. My son won the state spelling bee. I could say it loving. My son won the state spelling bee. Joyful. My son won the state spelling bee. Irreverent. Nah, my son won the state spelling bee. Optimistic. My son won the state spelling bee. <laughs> okay, so uh, that's, the, the, that's the sound of your voice when you're reading something aloud or when you're producing your own meaning. When you're reading a story, um, you don't have that advantage, you know, uh, as, as far as like figuring out what the tone should be when you read it aloud. Um, so you do that through a couple different things. The main one is diction. So when you think about tone and think about diction, the other thing that really influences tone is syntax. That's how sentences are built. Sentences can be simple, they can be complex, they can have a lot of different pieces, they can be, you know, have just one main clause. Um, so when you're reading diction, diction is kind of like the first thing that you should look at for tone. Diction is word choice. But that always sounds too broad, right? Like. Uh, talk about the diction in this piece of writing here. Uh, well, he chose all these words, and that's his diction. Because it's word choice, and he chose these words. So Ernest Hemingway's diction for this piece of writing is all these words. Those are his choices. So it's actually a step beyond that. That it requires a little bit of interpretation and a little bit of thinking. So, so word choice is like... Because mm, we have so many choices for different words. So um, let's see if we can read this a little bit and figure out some, some diction words, like if we're gonna characterize them. Let me show you, there's also a list, like it's kind of known for different styles of diction. One that's kind of fun to talk about, and I think I'll take a, a few of them and, uh, and I'll write them in here. I also have a big piece of paper that's got all these on it too. These are like, well, yeah, I'll just, there's a list right there. So you could copy these out if you wanted to. Abstract. Here's so here's tone over here. You can see there's way more tones. There's actually two pages of tones. There's like 150 different ways to to describe the tone of something. Grim, gullible. Oh my, they're all so good. But if we go over here to the diction words, there's fewer. Um, but so like the diction is what kind of words? So we're generalizing. I'm gonna write that word down. I'm also gonna write this phrase on this piece of paper because that's where you're at. So word choice, you're, um, so if I'm interpreting, so this is interpretation. I am interpreting a tone. So if I am interpreting a tone, I'm generalizing about the kinds of words.
So So, what do you need in order to generalize about the kinds of words? Well, you have to have an understanding of like different kinds of words. So what are different kinds of words? Well, I'm gonna copy a couple of them in here. So, uh, cacophonous, that's really fun. Cacophonous is a word that sounds like what it means. Cacophonous is our words that like hurt your ear because they're so jarring. Like they don't sound smooth and easy. Cacophonous. What about obscene? That's a you know inappropriate. We'd call it inappropriate these days. That's not appropriate. Uh, obscene words that are not school appropriate. Casual. These are all just different. Nostalgic, brusque, monosyllabic. That describes words that only have one syllable. You know, um, patriotic, passionate, colorful, ornate. Ornate is good. Ornate means like fancy. So you could copy that word, and if you wanted to, ornate diction. Esoteric means hard to understand, like you're not, like esoteric means you use a lot of words that are not known by everybody. Uh, symbolic or subdued. Figurative, if you use tons of metaphors and really, you know, figurative diction, we could talk about a writer like Poe or Flowery for Poe. Um, informal versus formal, these are all different ways. Big ones are uh, informal. Formal. So the idea being, like for informal versus formal, you know, if I'm going to greet someone, I have a lot of choices for different ways to greet people. I could, I could say, what up, what up, right? I could say, what up, and people know what that means. That's a choice. That's a, that's a, or I could say, greetings. So. These could be characterized as in different ways, you know. So, what up is informal. Greetings is more formal. Um, so, when you're reading a story, that's what you're looking for. You're like, okay, what can I say about these words for this type of story? So, let me look. Let's let's look at the end of something and see if we can see something, um, you know, that would be like good words so we can say like that's the diction of the words. I'm gonna read this paragraph right here. The one-story bunkhouses, the eating house, the company store, the mill offices, and the big mill itself stood deserted in the acres of sawdust that covered the swampy meadow. So if you look at deserted, sawdust, swampy. Now those three words, do they have a tone? Do they have a feeling? Do they create like a mood? Ten years later, there was nothing left of the mill except the broken white limestone. Broken white limestone of its foundation showing through the swampy second growth as Nick and Marjorie rode along the shore. They were trolling along the edge of the channel bank where the bottom dropped off suddenly from sandy shallows to 12 feet of dark water. They were trolling on their way to the point to set night lines for rainbow trout. So if you were going to characterize this diction, like these style of words, deserted, swampy, sawdust, you can characterize them a couple different ways. One of them is they're simple. These are like, these are not difficult to understand words. And that is a feature of Ernest Hemingway. Ernest Hemingway was a writer who believed in writing simply. So we have simple words, so simple diction. Is it monosyllabic? Not quite, but sawdust, swampy, deserted, broken white limestone, second growth, dark water. Okay, so it's simple, deserted and sawdust and broken white, dark water. All these kind of have like a tone of like, what's, so, so we have simple diction. What other diction words could we say? Are there others that we could say fit? It's not flowery, shocking, exact. It's kind of exact. Is it concrete? It's very concrete. Common. So these are different 
I almost think it's like nostalgic. So it's like looking back. It's talking about things that were. So simple diction with common words. He uses these effectively to create a tone. And I would say their tone is like, it's, it is looking at the past. It's like, um, and it's kind of sad and kind of quiet. It's talking about what was, used to be there. Um, and I think that word is maybe nostalgic. Looking back. So, um, so that's kind of like how you would look at tone and diction, word choice, um, for somebody like Ernest Hemingway. Now, tone is particularly important, and, and a tone can vary from par paragraph to paragraph. So tone can shift. And shifts in tone are really important to notice when you're, when you're analyzing things uh, very carefully. So let's look at a little bit of um, Hemingway's rival, William Faulkner, and see how he starts his story. What kind of words does he use in the beginning? When Miss Emily Grierson died, our whole town went to her funeral. The men, through a sort of respectful affection, respectful affection. So you can see right away, it's like a little bit more formal for a fallen monument. Ooh, still looking back at the past, but it's in a different way. The women mostly out of curiosity to see the inside of a house, which no one had seen save an old manservant, a combined gardener and cook, had seen in the last 10 years. It was a big squarish frame house that had once been white, decorated with cupolas and spires and scrolled balconies in the heavy lightsome style of the 70s, said on once had been, once been our, what had once been our most select street. But garages and cotton gins had encroached and obliterated. Okay? So here's like a difference between Faulkner and Hemingway. They actually thought about this. They had like uh, arguments, or not really arguments, but like they said bad things about each other's writing sometimes. Um, and um, Faulkner claimed that uh, that Hemingway didn't know how to use words like obliterated, which is why instead of obliterated, he would have like left or something something quiet and very small. But obliterated is too too fancy, you know. So the diction is. Looking at, oh, and there's more, you know, coquettish decay. So, so they're both talking about the past, but they're doing so in a very different style. Coquettish decay. Like, never would Hemingway use a phrase like coquettish decay. So, if we looked at that diction, we could say uh, obscure. So these are some of the words that might work for for uh, Faulkner, it's obscure, poetic, maybe poetic, cultured, refined, you know, it's more flowery. Melodious, lyrical, which establishes a tone You know, what's the difference between these two stories in tone? Well, this one, the end of something and a rose for Emily. This, the word that I always come up to for the end of something is it's quiet. It doesn't, it doesn't announce anything loud. It's not, it's not a loud presence. It's not, it's not, uh, it's not trying to blow your mind with like amazing diction or, um, but what it is doing is it's trying to to reveal the simple truth about relationships. And it seems much more realistic. So this is a realistic story that could happen to anyone. This one is nuts. Now, he's trying to communicate a, a deep truth about the South and about, um, about a patriarchy and women and all. He's trying to, he's trying to do something, um, but it's just that the, it's much more contrived, which means like, there's not really a lady named Emily who really, you know, slept with a body in her house for that many years. He invented all that to, to, to do something. So in that way, it's more like Poe. 
in that he's created something to like that's extraordinary, that's extra larger than life. Whereas the end of something is very powerful. I think it's very powerful. Uh, but it's not trying to blow you away with like some amazing scenario. It's a very believable and very plausible scenario. So um, tone is important in two places. Tone is really important in setting. And it's really important in characterization or the description of characters. Um, and we're going to see that. Uh, we're going to see like a shift in tone here because this is had once been obliterated, coquettish decay, um, eyesore. These are the these are the words that stick out for me as indicative of a tone. And now Miss Emily had gone to join representative of those August names. Um, cemetery ranked in uh, Yeah. So this is kind of like, um, especially with fallen monument, respectful of um, affect affection and like all these words it's kind of like a serious somber look at the past um, it's not overly dark it's it's somewhat dark with coquettish decay but it's not like po dark of like despair and that is uh, in the setting So, we looked at our tone words. Oh my goodness, look at all of them. There's so many of them. So, I kind of saying confused, contemptuous, critical, demeaning. It's none of these. It's not aggressive. It's not absurd. It's kind of um, reverent, I guess, might be a word. I would assume that it's on this list. So, dignified. It's almost like dignified. Yeah, dignified. Maybe somewhat detached. So, serious, respectful, former, kind of proper. Aloof, objective, kind of distant. Um, what else is it? Solemn, maybe solemn. But it's not like super dark. Now let's see the diction in the description of uh, what Miss Emily looked like. Here she is. And you always want to look like at the first time a character is introduced. That's when it's that's when the that's when a lot of the work of describing is done. They rose when she entered a small, fat woman in black, with a thin gold chain descending to her waist and vanishing into her belt, leaning on an ebony cane with a tarnished gold head. Her skeleton was small and spare, perhaps that is why she would have been merely plumpness and another obesity in her. She looked bloated like a body long submerged. So now you can see like these words really pop as like a shift, a shift in diction, a shift in tone. So these words, um, they're very dark. They have very like, they're almost um, this great word right here, macabre, which is macabre, you can associate that with Poe. Macabre is like gruesome horrifying, frightening. So um, that's kind of like a, a little shift in the tone that comes from the diction. So how is the, so if we're gonna describe the words, so it's like tone describes like um, a set, like a set of, well, it's, it's, it's diction and syntax combined. Also setting. It's, a, it's an accumulation of a lot of different things that come together to shape a tone. But if we look at purely the words that shape the tone, then we're talking about diction. Um, so the word macabre is a good word for that. So that's how diction and tone work together and, the, and, the, and of course the important thing is always like meaning you know so what does that have to do with the meaning 
Um, I did want to talk real briefly about characterization and the stylistic differences between authors, between a Hemingway and a Faulkner, because, uh, so here we have much simpler diction, simpler sentences. The sentences are, are quite simple. Um, they have like simple subjects and verbs. Uh, Ten years later, there was nothing in the mill. They were trolling, they were trolling. Um, and then we have our first description of a character. This is one other word that, that uh, this story really brings out, and that word is inference. With Hemingway, you have to infer. Hemingway. He is sparse in his details. That could be a form of, you know, his diction is sparse. It's not, it's not overflowing with language. There's our old ruin, Nick, Marjorie said. This is the first time Marjorie is in this story. No physical description. So compare that to, um, compare that to Emily Grierson. Um, do we get any physical description from Emily in this story? So uh, Hemingway is, is spare in his use of description, whereas like uh, Poe is extreme in the opposite, and uh, Faulkner is closer to Poe than he is to Hemingway.